it looked like what I would imagine hell to be. The sky was pure red. Everything was on fire. The landscape, the houses that were in the distance, there were certain areas where just lava was just kind of bubbling up everywhere. There was this major lava river that was now flowing down into Lower Puna. We kept having to remind ourselves that this is real. I was so awestruck that I realized how powerless I am uh, being on this planet. My name is Anthony Quintano. I'm the engagement editor for Honolulu Civil Beat. I'm also the backup photographer slash videographer. I was scheduled to join a media escort by the Hawaii National Guard to go into Leilani Estates to see activity. Uh, when I showed up to the media escort, I had, my first question was, are we going to go see Fissure 16? Uh, we were told we, uh, we were not going to see 16. Uh, due to safety reasons. So a number of us got in our cars and decided to head over to Fissure 16 to try to see it ourselves uh, before it died out, if it died out. We're, we parked alongside the highway about to hike into the fissure. Uh, we started our hike and we got about halfway there and we could feel and slightly hear this churning sound and the feeling of the ground rumbling. It was like a constant earthquake but very minor, it was very subtle, but you can, you can definitely feel it. And my heart started racing because I, I have never seen lava, I've never felt an earthquake, I've never witnessed any kind of volcanic activity in person. I started hiking faster and eventually we see the lava shooting up above the tree line. Red glowing lava shooting into the sky and then on all sides you see the lava kind of pouring and spilling down the sides of this this, what they call a cinder cone. The first thing that everyone told us is make sure you have your, your gas masks. Um, so I instantly got my mask on, started immediately shooting video and just kind of capturing moments of this, of this fissure that opened up. Um, so I feel like I have to say what a vent is in order to describe what a fissure is. A vent is a opening in the ground that has steam coming out. In order for a vent to become a fissure, it actually has to have lava spattering out of the vent. And about, about 10 or 15 minutes into shooting, uh, I felt something hit my shoulder. And then I look and I notice that there was a burn mark in my vest. And my, I, I instantly panicked because I think of lava like acid. Like it'll just continue to burn through anything regardless of what you do. So I'm freaking out. We started to take a couple steps back. Probably about an hour and a half later, we noticed we had stepped back so much that the area that we initially moved in on was filled with lava. And we were just awestruck by everything that was happening around us. What I kept saying to myself is, this is so much bigger than me. I am a storm chaser. Um, I had worked with the Weather Channel. They had a storm chasing crew called Tornado Hunt. We would go out for periods of time during the tornado season uh, around Tornado Alley, uh, Oklahoma, um, and Colorado, Eastern Colorado. Getting into a storm cell and trying to find a tornado has been, you know, before seeing the volcano, one of the scariest experiences I've had. I, I don't want to say I do it for the adrenaline. My father died when he was 55. I just turned 40. In my head, I feel like I don't have that much more time on this earth. And I'm scared to waste that sitting at a desk and never moving or never traveling. I want to experience everything. I want to experience everything. I want to feel alive. And that's why I would cover storms, why I would cover volcanic activity, things that are you wouldn't normally witness in day-to-day -day life. After spending a couple hours documenting Fisher 16, I come out of the woods. I'm exhausted, I'm dehydrated. I just wanted to get out of there. This car comes rolling down the hill and I kindly asked the driver to give me a ride out since I was so tired I didn't want to hike back out. The driver kindly offered to 
take me up to his house, which is at the top of the hill nearby, and give me a drink of water and check out the view of Fissure 16. We got up to the house and he showed me the view from his balcony and you can see the lava firing above the tree line. He kindly asked, do you guys want to stay here? He was telling me how uh, he appreciates local journalism and local journalists. I was kind of flabbergasted that the homeowner even offered that to us because uh, you know, he's in the middle of evacuating his house. This volcanic activity is threatening his property and he's now inviting a total stranger to stay at his house. I was so grateful. That's all I could think about is just how grateful I was for him to offer that to us. I met a couple of other photographers in the area and I invited them to come stay at the house overnight. Uh, we get a couple of hours of sleep in before we are awoken by an explosion. Uh, we all race to the balcony to take a look at what, what's going on and we see lava shooting up into the air from a different location. Clearly this is a new fissure that had opened up. There was these loud gas explosions that would occur probably about every five to 10 minutes. And some of them were very weak, but then some of them would rock the house. The whole blast would shutter the house and even bow the glass to the point where the glass looks like it's gonna shatter. But in addition to these explosions going off, right next to it, it's spattering lava, probably about a couple hundred feet into the air. There's no cinder cone, no nothing. It's just firing out lava consistently. And we're just glued to it. We, get, we immediately get our cameras you know, out on the balcony. We're live streaming. We're like, I can't believe this is happening. It's amazing. So my, my mother, my wife, my brother, family members, friends, were lighting up my Facebook saying, Anthony, what are you doing? You're crazy. This is nuts. I said, I cannot pull myself away from this. This, uh, this is history happening in front of us and I cannot leave. We were broadcasting from this house for at least a month. We would feel these four to five point magnitude earthquakes before you know, those gas explosions would go off on 17. The thing that I was scared about was one of these fissures opening up underneath the house the way that they've been opening up in Leilani Estates. There is actually a crater, an old dormant crater from a previous eruption that's actually behind the house. So we would actually go outside and check the ground for cracks, for steam coming up, open vents, uh, heat coming out of the ground. We did no notice that some of the vegetation was dying in the area. Uh, so that kind of caused some concern. Uh, the explosions were the other scary part. We were worried that glass from the house was gonna shatter all over the place because of the sound of the blast but it did become normal. I know because I was standing in the kitchen and I was making breakfast while these explosions are going off. And I'm standing there thinking to myself, I'm actually cooking bacon and eggs with a volcano shooting lava and exploding only a mile, mile away from us. I'm like, how surreal is this? We kept reminding each other. We would keep saying, it's like, dude, I can't believe we're standing here. I can't believe we're doing this. Uh, whenever we did a media escort with the Hawaii National Guard, they would say, you could die. You go in there, you could die. And they would go into all the ways that we could die and list them off. And then ask us again, do you still want to go in there? Nobody would say, no. There's a house that was just downhill, much closer to the Fissure 17, which is still shooting lava hundreds of feet into the air and causing gas explosions. And you can clearly see, one, there's people still lingering around this house, but you can also clearly see that the lava bombs that are shooting in the air are hitting this house. And later we had found out that um, a civilian had gotten hit by a lava bomb in the leg on the balcony of that house. There was a time where we were escorted in by the National Guard to see inside Leilani Estates. The entire neighborhood was covered in pyroclasts. Whenever lava was shooting into the air, it would cool and form a rock and hit the ground. Anything that comes out of a volcano, I've learned, is a pyroclast. And I actually got hit by a pyroclast. These rocks had rained down on the entire, there were roofs that were covered. It looked like a black snowfall. 
We were in touch with the homeowner on a daily basis. The, a lot of the reason why they did not choose to stay at their house to experience all this is because of the stress of it all and the fear that they might lose their house. They would share videos on their social media accounts expressing the awe of everything that's happening. The, how amazing it is and how scary it is and how terrible it is at the same time that you know people have to lose their homes while this beautiful, beautiful thing is occurring. There was a moment where there was two days towards the end where they thought they could actually get back into their house and things were gonna be okay. The lava river that had formed was remaining pretty, pretty consistent, so it was actually safe enough for the homeowners to return to their home. They were back in their house for probably a few days and experienced what we were experiencing on their balcony for themselves. The plan was for me to come back and install a camera on the cell tower that's near their house. The day that I'm flying back, the lava river had changed to the point where it was gonna cut off the access road to get to their home. And not only cut off the access road, but cut the power to their home as well. And at this point, um, my heart sank. The homeowners are gonna have to evacuate and probably will never be able to get back into their home. Okay, I'm gonna go turn this last light off. Okay. This has been a very interesting chapter in my life, I must say. You know? Yes. I've been very happy here. Yeah. I miss it. We work so hard. So, come on. We ended up meeting the homeowners uh, the next day for dinner. They had told us that they are going to be uh, moving back to the mainland temporarily. They laughed and joked about possibly opening up this lava Airbnb that they can invite tourists to see this amazing lava field that has, you know, has taken over their land in front of their house. Roughly about a month and a half to two months later, the lava river that was closest to their house ignited the dead vegetation that was surrounding their home causing wildfires to destroy their house. I was able to fly back to the island and do an aerial flight to take a look at what had happened to Fisher 8 and the home. And I could see all that was left was this metal sheet, which was their roof, lying on the ground with ash bordering it. I felt devastated for the homeowners they're trying to determine whether or not to even return to Hawaii. There was a GoFundMe that started while we were live streaming from their property. And a number of the people who were watching the live stream that we were broadcasting had donated money to them, to the homeowners, for, to thank them for allowing us to stream from there. We were getting messages from people all over the world saying that they were teaching their kids about volcanoes while watching our live stream. A lot of the reason why my wife and I moved to Hawaii was so that we could experience something new and we could do something unique so that I could say that I lived my life. I wanted to see lava up close and personal. I never thought I was gonna see it in the way that I saw it during this event. And I just couldn't step away from it. I had to keep covering it until it stopped. I want to shoot lava every day of my life. I want to chase down volcanoes erupting all over the world. I'm addicted, hooked. The best thing that has ever happened to me is marrying my wife. The second thing was experiencing this lava up close.